I almost, I almost feel as though I could go home because <laughs> that is why I do this, right? One story. And that's why I do the whole thing. A story that can shift the perception of a whole audience, a path through history where determination on the part of a mother and a grandmother can shift the trajectory of a whole family forever. That's what Girl Rising is all about. Girl Rising is a global campaign for girls' education. Why education? That's my first question for you guys. I mean, it seems so obvious, but actually I want you to tell me, why does education matter? Which one of you? Yeah. Because when you're educated, you have more choices. You have choices because you understand them. What else? Why does education matter? You can build a better future. You can change the course of history of your family. Why else? What does education give you? Control. Control of your life. Control of your destiny. Control of your environment. One more. A job. A job. And what does a job give you? <coughs> Stability. Stability. Security. Security. Physical security. Emotional security. Power. A job gives you power because resources help you have power. When you have resources, you have power, you have choices. You and is any of that possible without education? No. Why girls? Why do girls matter? I want answers, guys. You guys are really smart. Because girls are strong. Boys are strong, too. Boys are strong, too. They sure can, and why is that? What do we all have in common? Mothers. Oh, yes, we do. And if our mothers have security and choices and understanding and power and safety, how does that make our lives? So, boys, do you agree? 100%. <laughs> right. So this is not just a campaign for women and girls. It's a campaign for women and girls and boys and men. Because if we all agree today, right, that it makes sense to have a safe, smart, educated mom who can make good choices like to vaccinate you before the age of five so you don't die, boy or girl, that's a good thing. So. The interesting thing about girl, this is so ugly. I'd left this here before. I'm going to put it underneath. Um, the interesting thing about Girl Rising is it started actually as a research pro project on breaking cycles of poverty. And now we've all done enough question and answer that it's not really a surprise that it, that it was a you know, white paper project. We didn't come in with a gender lens. I may be a woman, but I came at this with no bias. But now that we've discussed it and seen firsthand that what happens when you educate a girl and then she becomes a grandma who insists on education for her next generation, um, it turned out that when we called experts in poverty alleviation across every discipline, um, agriculture, infant mortality, maternal health, peace and security, the one thing that they all had in common when they answered the question, how how do things work in your specialty? What's really working was, oh, girls' education. In countries where girls are educated and they become women, mothers who participate fully in society, you see stability and you see benefits across society. So we are a team of journalists. Um, I grew up at ABC News, which you heard a little bit about, covering breaking news stories and running all over the world. And when you're a journalist, the holy grail is a story that is so important that could, that if people knew about it and changed their behavior accordingly, would have incredible benefits. 
It's like what leads the evening news, a breakthrough in cancer. Why? Because it has incredible benefits. So this idea that educating girls had incredible benefits across society felt like the story of a lifetime. And Girl Rising was our effort to tell that story. We've heard that first stat. I intimated to the second one. The research is with us. The research is the underpinning of Girl Rising. And what we wanted to do was to create a campaign that would spread a powerful and very simple message, right? How do you roll up that data? I don't know how many of you actually read that data, but whenever I look at that slide, I can't actually get myself to read the stuff on it. I think it looks pretty. Did you read it? No, right? Because it's like, ah! But, you know, if you worked at Google, you would have read it. So different things for different audiences because, you know. But for most of us, the data is important, but we need something simple that we can remember. Educate girls, change the world. And what else do we need? We need stories. We need the human experience. We need to understand, we need to shorten the bridge between data and us. Shorten the bridge between people we're used to looking at and people we know. And that's what storytelling can do. Actually, that was my third question for you, why storytelling, and now I've given it away. So storytelling has this incredible, how many of you just cried? Right? We bridged the gap between one human being's experience and my visit here, which is actually based in policy and kind of boring. So with Girl Rising, we're a team of journalists. We believe in the power of storytelling. We believe in the tools of mass media to change the way people see themselves and the way people see the world. And so we set out to make a truly global film. And the way we decided to do it is that we would travel the world to find originally 10 girls. So for all of you who started big things and you change your mind halfway through, it's OK. This project was told 10 times 10 for three whole years. Nine by nine doesn't have the same ring to it. A girl rising is better. So we traveled the world, and we found nine girls from nine countries around the world. And we looked for girls whose experiences reflected the barriers to education that girls face and boys don't. Because that's the reality. Girls face barriers to education like child marriage, um, cutting, violence, gender discrimination around labor practices that take away the opportunity to, to go to school and to stay in school, that boys just don't, by virtue of the fact that at 12 they get their period and stuff happens, right? So we wanted to find nine girls whose personal experience intersected um, with the barriers that girls faced education. Um, and we need to make these stories powerful, so we recruited nine writers from the same countries of the girl, of, as the girls who had lifted themselves by virtue of their education and their skills as storytellers. And we asked those writers to spend time with each girl, first of all, to make the final pick, and then to spend time with each girl and transform that girl's story into a screenplay. And the final piece was finding the most extraordinary, talented performers in the working in the world today to bring those girls' stories to life. And those, ta those actresses and Liam Neeson brought two qualities to the table. Don't underestimate the power of Liam Neeson. Um, <laughs> he is God. Um, which was not just, they're famous for a reason, they're amazing performers. But they're also globally famous. And I believe that when globally famous people do things, other people follow them. So this is the most important story in the world, so why not get Meryl Streep to help us tell it, right? That seems like a good idea to me. Hugely important to the project was partnership. At the core of this project, partners with, with seven nonprofit organizations that spend their time and their resources and their human capital helping girls go to school, helping girls overcome the barriers to education that girls face every day. As storytellers, we knew that we'd need their help to make the best film and to find our girls, and we thought we could give them something in return, a tool, 
a tool that they could use to talk to their audiences about the work that they do. And so we collaborated with the organizations on the screen here um, to create a global campaign for girls' education. We also collaborated with corporations. We collaborated with policy leaders. Um, the two founders of this organization were very helpful along the way. President Clinton and, and the secretary have been amazing supporters of Girl Rising, unofficially. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the behind the scenes of making the film. So here we are in Nepal. That's Richard Robbins. Um, we had a lot of these sort of group meetings as we encouraged these girls to tell us their stories. It wasn't always easy. Often no one's listening to a girl in many of these places. Um, and what we were looking for were the nuggets that would help us um, create a narrative that would marry their lives with these global policy uh, figures and data. That's Richard. So the film was made by a man, and I think that's important to know. Um, and here we are in Ethiopia. Some of the behind the scenes um, uh, uh, experiences were extraordinary. Um, this is Asmara. She lives in the northern part of Ethiopia. And what Richard would say when he was, when he was shooting there, that it wasn't the um, environment that was challenging. Asmara is incredibly shy. That was a challenge in terms of telling her story. It was that in every, um, it's a very, um, how many of you have seen the film? So if you remember the Ethiopian, that's actually Meryl Streep's segment. If you remember, it's a very um, quiet story. It's a story of child marriage. It's a very quiet but powerful story. Um, well, what, what you don't see is that in every shot, there was a crowd. <laughs> and so Richard was always turning to tell the kids to shh, while these sort of Martians from out of space were shooting their village friend, Asmara, in front of this weird white screen. What's happening there? Um, and then the other thing that we faced, not just in Ethiopia, but everywhere, was cattle. So, um, you know, we would be on our way to a shoot, and, um, and the crew would say, well, we just lost an hour because there were cattle crossing the street. Um, one of the um, important elements uh, to storytelling is, um, is identifying what brings us all together. Identifying, again, if we're trying to close the gap between us and them, what, what, what unites us? Um, and one of the things that came up again and again was the arts. So when you see the film, or if you've seen the film, um, you'll see that music, poetry, the writing itself of the narration, the arts really play an important role um, in, in dynamic storytelling. Um, and here you see Roxana, who lives on the streets of Calcutta, who loves to draw and paint. And her whole chapter is, yes, about her father, about the role that her father plays um, in her life, supporting her dream to be an artist. And what you won't see is that um, the biggest challenge, there were two big challenges about shooting in India. Um, one was that it was monsoon season. So it is actually, um, uh, it ends up playing into the narrative of the story, which is a metaphor for um, the sun coming out. Um, but that metaphor was forced because Richard said he was either drenched in sweat or the heavens had opened up. Um, and so this actually ends up being an incredibly poignant scene. Um, the heavens has opened, and uh, Roxana's family is deciding uh, their house has been destroyed, and they're deciding whether or not uh, to stay in the city. They're from a village, and they've moved to the city um, because the father is determined that his daughters are educated, uh, and they're deciding whether or not uh, to go home. And the father has finally relented and said to his wife, you're right, we're going to leave. It's too difficult in the city. We'll go back to the village. And she said, no. No, we're staying. She'd been the one saying, let's go back to the village. No, we're staying. Um, and then the sun comes out. And what you won't also see is that in India, um, there's a ritual of blessing the camera. And um, we were shooting for eight days. So each one of these shoots was really like a Hollywood film set shoot. Um, and uh, towards the end, um, Richard was starting to feel super stressed about uh, time and completing because, you know, time is money. Uh, and on the morning of 
the second to last day, he said, guys, we are not blessing the camera today. We got to get going. Let's just get this show on the road. And what do you think happened? Camera broke. Yeah, 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 camera broke. They didn't bless the camera, and the camera broke. So he will never be going against God again. <laughs> this is Wadley from Haiti. Um, and it's actually the Haitian experience that we had um, was counter to many of the others. I'm going to say almost all of the others, which was that we wanted to make a film that was uplifting, that was inspirational, that was colorful, that was beautiful. Because everywhere we went, we met girls who saw nothing but beauty around them, who were ready for their shot at life, who were determined and happy and dreaming big, bold dreams. Um, but Haiti was actually an exception. It's a really difficult place to be, even today. And you know, we had been to Egypt, we had been to Afghanistan, we had been um, to, to, to the rural parts of Nepal, we'd been to the top of a mountain where it was very thin air to breathe in Peru, um, a very difficult place to live. And what Richard said was Haiti was the most difficult. And he almost gave up. He, it was the last day of the last day of interviews, and it was the last interview, when Wadley bounced into the chair. And I like to say that this project has been blessed, every step of the way, and this was no exception. Because when you do see the film, for those of you who haven't, um, and for those of you who have, um, Wadley is magical. She is magical. Um, when she, uh, in the film, seven of the girls play themselves, and two are played by actors. And Wadley plays herself, and she's the second story in the film. So with each story, uh, with each girl, the writer made the decision about who um, she would work with. And this is. Um, uh, Luang Ong spending time with Soka um, on their trip, and they are still, um, uh, uh, they see each other, they write letters back and forth. Um, Soka is in college. She's an amazing girl. She was uh, um, rescued from a dump when she was nine years old. Uh, her, both her parents died, and she'd been living on the dump for four years. And she has gone from one school in Phnom Penh to the next school, to the next school, to the next school. And she graduated top of her class in high school, and she's now in college. Uh, and her dream is to teach the next generation of boys and girls in Cambodia how to read and write. Because for her, that's, her, that's the ticket to the, to the future. And here she is in a makeshift warehouse um, after she left the dump uh, and enrolled in, a, in um, a New Day Cambodia, the program that has uh, seen her through her adolescence. She learned this talent of Apsara dance, which was almost eradicated by the Khmer Rouge. And the story that is narrated by Alicia Keys at the top of the film is a metaphor for her rebirth. And it's her getting ready to dance. And once again, the arts come together um, to give us the backbone uh, of Soka's story. So now I'm going to give you a little glimpse of um, what uh, we found in the field, and then I'll play you a little bit of the, um, the story from Nepal so that you can see really the transition from, and the leap of imagination from raw footage gathered on the first trip with the film team looking for our candidates to the final production. Um, and so this is Suma. And Suma uh, was sold into slavery at the age of six by her family, um, not because they didn't love her, because they did love her. And they thought that was the only hope for her future. Um, at the age of 12, she escaped um, from servitude and um, ended up in a program run by our partners at Room to Read. Um, and she is now a very vocal advocate um, across Nepal to end Kamlari. Um, so this is what Soka looked like when we, I mean, Suma looked like when we met her. And we asked her uh, about her life, as we did with all of the, um, the candidates we interviewed. And she told us a little bit. She told us that basically what I told you, that she was sold into slavery at age 12, and I mean, at age 6, and she didn't get home again to her parents at age 12. And one of the things she said that has always moved me is that by the time she got back to her parents, she could not speak their local dialect of Nepalese. So she could not speak the same language as her parents. Um, and when we asked her for sort of details, as what journalist does, right, asked for details of her experience as a slave, she said, I can't, I'm not going to tell you the details. 
but I'll tell you how I got through it. I got through it with song. So I'll sing you a, one of the songs that I wrote during that time. And so um, this is it. And it's, uh, because of the way my computer runs, the syncing might be a little off, so I'll try to just look past that. Sarti bato hamadabada ka kajan ma dilu ta chai ha ka kajan ma dilu ta chai ha dukha de na man raha padai dukha de na man raha padava janma dilu ta chai ha ka ka janma dilu ta chai ha dadu bhaiya school ma paharna mai dukhi chai jindar wa ghar jaina mai dukhi chai jindar wa ghar jaina Sadda bhara malki niya phathale Mara khai na kasin mari jiban Mara khai na kasin mari jiban Sarthi bato ho hama dai baba Kaka jan ma dilu ta chai ha so here she is when, with Manjushri Tapa, who um, helped to write her story for the film, and Carrie Washington, who has lent her voice and her platform to not just SUMA, but the whole Girl Rising project. And when <coughs> Carrie Washington tweets about Girl Rising as she did last week, we, we hit a whole new group of people who would never come to this event tonight. And I think that's a good thing. So now I'm going to have to just switch screens so if it's not seamless, forgive me. Um, but this is an action shot from the, sh from the actual shoot, um, and I'm going to play from a, um, off YouTube, if we're not failed here, um, from, uh, from the final film. Here's the hard truth. In spite of the fact that educating a girl is one of the highest return investments available in the developing world, millions of girls just aren't making it. Right now, there are 66 million girls out of school, and many more who struggle every day to simply remain where they belong, in a classroom. In the developing world, getting an education is not what people expect girls to do. Girls are expected to work, expected to fetch water, to care for younger children, to get jobs, or worse. It happens to girls like Suma. Suma's parents didn't send her to school. They sent her to work. It's called Kanlari. I write songs to remind myself that my memories are real. And often, because there's so much sadness behind me, what comes out is sad. Both of my parents were bonded as Kamlar and Kamlari in their childhood. That's the way things have been around here. That's the way they have been for the poor. You have to bond yourself to a master, otherwise 
How will you live? This was the house of my first master. My mother and father bonded me just so that I would have somewhere to live and enough food to eat. I was six years old. Fagutharu was a landlord and a miller. He made me work from four in the morning to late at night. I had to clean the house and wash the dishes and go to the forest to fetch firewood. When I wasn't minding the goats, I had to mind the children. The goats were nicer. The daughters made fun of me because my clothes were torn. They teased me. They beat me. I wanted my mother and father to take me back. I wanted them to let me stay at home and go to school like my brother. But when I thought about how poor they were and how much they too had suffered, it made me feel weak. I couldn't ask. This was the house of my second master. Janak Mala wore a uniform to work. He and the mistress of the house were very hard-hearted. Unlucky girl, they used to call me. Hey, unlucky girl, do this, they'd shout. They made me sleep in the goat shed and wear rags and eat scraps from their dirty plates. I can't really talk about everything that happened to me here, but I will never forget. This is where I began to write songs. Only the songs got me through. This was the house of my third master. I was 11 years old when I arrived at Chitai Tharu's house. I had been a Kamlari for five years. It wasn't as bad here. I mean, it was bad because there was a lot of work. But there was a lodger in that house, a school teacher called Bimusar. He changed my life. Just to 
Bimal sir convinced my master and mistress to enroll me in a night class. All of us would gather after finishing our day's work and we would learn to read and write. I loved that night class so much. It was run by social workers for girls just like me, Kamlaris. We would also talk to the teachers about what it was like to be a Kamlari. And as we talked, we began to realize that bonded labor was, and isn't it, slavery. The teachers who ran the night class began to go from house to house. They wanted to liberate us. One teacher, Sita Didi, told my master that he was breaking the law by keeping me as a Kamlari. She talked about the law against bonded labor and the law about children's rights and the law on labor rights and the law against domestic violence and trafficking. She talked to him about justice and injustice and she demanded that he set me free. My master said no. Once made, a bond couldn't be broken. Sita Didi didn't give up. She kept arguing. She came back day after day. And in the end, she led me home to my mother and father. I am my own master now. I have no mistress. I was the last bonded worker in my family. After me, everyone will be free. I feel as though I have power. I feel like I can do anything. And I have important things to do. Inside this house is a girl like I was. Away from her parents, working morning to night, wanting so badly to be free. We have come to this house, the house of her master, to say, we know you have a Kamlari working for you. You must set her free. I've seen where change comes from. When it comes, it's like a song you can't hold back. Suddenly, there's a breath moving through you and you're singing. And others pick up the tune and start singing too. And a sweet melody goes out into the world and touches the heart of one person, then another, and another. Suma's story, and it's just one of the nine chapters of the film. And our goal with this film was to use it as a tool, a tool to engage audiences, to bring people together, 
and to raise the value of the girl, to shift perceptions of how people see the girl and the opportunity of investing in her. And that means screenings at the World Bank with the leaders who shape our world and who make incredibly important decisions about how resources are spent and where girls and women fit in the programs that they are managing. It means using it as a tool to reach 2,000 kids in Zimbabwe so that they could see their, their region, their country, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers in a new way. And it means being on the, ringing the bell at NASDAQ and being at the center of Times Square so that everyone moving through Times Square understands that educating girls is an incredibly good investment. So our campaign is about raising awareness, unlocking resources for girls' education, and shifting the minds of our leaders so that they prioritize girls' education as they're deciding how our world should be organized. So with that, I'd love to take your questions. Um, I think we have about 10, 15 minutes for that. We do have time for some questions, so please, uh, if you have some, raise your hands and we'll get the microphone to you if anyone has a question. We need some girls rising in here. We do. There we go. Thank you. My name is Rocio Ortega Richard, and I have a question. You say, um, you said how our world should be organized. In the United States, we have thousands of young Latina girls that are undocumented, and we are denying them the right to an education. I work with young girls, and we have thousands of girls all over the United States that want to dream and reach the stars, mm -hmm. but we don't let them. Mm -hmm. What is the suggestion about that? Because same story, they live in a trailer park in southwest Little Rock. Well, I couldn't agree more, and we actually had this conversation earlier this afternoon um, about the connection between the girls in our um, campaign and girls who live in cities like Little Rock. Um, and I see it from two perspectives. One, I'm not an expert on immigration and documentation and that sort of thing, but I think the president is working on it. <laughs> um, uh, but two, in regard to this film, um, this film has an incredibly powerful impact on the girls that you're talking about um, because, number one, it makes them understand that they're not alone. And number two, for the girls, I think in this country, even if you're undocumented, you're allowed to go to public school if you're under the age of 18. Um, for girls who are really less resourced in this country, um, and who spend most of their lives being pitied, these girls have so much less. And so it's a perception shift in terms of where they sit in the world, not as victims, but as actually in a better condition than some of their sisters around the world. And that's incredibly empowering because it can help them feel power, feel empowered, feel like, oh, I can go to school and do something and maybe help one of these girls who's in a much more difficult situation. So um, we've had, um, interestingly, in Detroit, we had um, these cards that say, um, uh, uh, share her story, which is basically share girl rising with your community. Talk about girls' education everywhere you go, and I'd make that call to action for you. Um, invest in her, set aside a few dollars every month so that a girl somewhere else can go to school. $35 for a year for a girl in the developing world to go to school. Um, uh, and stand with her. Advocate for her wherever you go. So in Detroit, guess what the organizers did? They made it about the girls in their community and they had the parents sign it. 
So very quickly you can change a film that's global into a film that's local. And I'd liken it to the screenings we've had in Nigeria. Um, we're, the next iteration of the project is we'll, we'll, we'll re-version it for India, Nigeria, and Congo. We'll take out Meryl Streep, Anne Hathaway, Alicia Keys, and replace those movie stars with locally Bollywood stars and Nollywood stars. And originally, um, we were told, well, in Nigeria, you don't have a Nigerian chapter, so the Nigerian audience is not going to like this. No. These are universal stories. And sometimes it helps not to have the finger pointed at you. Dana. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us. My name is Vina, and I'm an alum of the Clinton School, and I had the opportunity to work with Room to Read in the Berthia region for my international project, and it's great to, to get to see more of Suma's story. Uh, as you mentioned, you're reworking the project for those other countries. I was just uh, wondering what some of your other next steps are with the film, and I saw on there also a mention of the Girl Rising Foundation, and I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on that, and also how those of us in the community can get more involved in, uh, with your next steps. So um, the next steps of the, of the project are twofold. One, it's, um, so the film was on CNN International. It's reached millions of people around the world. Every day, I, my favorite part of my day is my Google Alert, where I learn about, on average, seven to 10 screenings that are happening all over the world every day, locally organized by um, organizations that um, are working with girls, want to work with girls, are raising money for girls. Um, so I couldn't, um, and, and there's a lot of road to go there. So continuing the distribution of the film at a global level, um, there are seven billion people in this world, and I want all of them to put on their Girl Rising glasses and see the world through the eyes of a girl at least once in their life. Um, so reversioning for India, Nigeria, and Congo, and con continuing to create um, media tools like this one that can empower the organizers around the world, people like Lynette from the Arkansas Women's Foundation, who um, don't have the budget or the professional expertise to create the messaging, but if we can do it on behalf of the issues here, she can use the messaging. So, um, and the Girl Rising Fund um, is our outward-facing consumer, it's our consumer-facing funding mechanism. So if you see Girl Rising and you want to give, um, we take that money quarterly and divide it equally amongst our seven uh, nonprofit partners, including Room to Read. So we're co co collecting um, that sort of grassroots donation on behalf of our partners. Um, we're also fundraising to create the media uh, and to reversion these these films. So we um, we have that, but it's a much more individually based fundraising ask. Thanks for asking. Hi, I'm Marta Collier. I work here in Little Rock at the Arkansas Science and Technology Authority. Um, we do a lot of intervention all across the spectrum. But my question for you is, what brought the seven partners together with you guys to do this project? I'm a journalist by training, but I work with scientists and engineers, and they often don't see the value of the storytelling. So I'm curious as to how did you get the coalition of people together so that you as a journalist was were respected enough to come in and share the story to make these tools? That's a great question, and I've never had it before, but I appreciate you asking it. Um, because partnership was actually, the, the building the campaign and those relationships came long before we shot a frame. And there were two kinds of partners we had to convince. One, nonprofit partners, that we weren't going to be like every other documentary that had come in saying, spend lots of time with us, show us all your girls, then we're going to make a movie, and we're going to forget all about you. Um, it was a steep climb. And two, um, corporations. We really thought that in the way the world is now organized, having a corporate partner was essential for reaching the scale we wanted to reach. Um, because corporations are starting to understand they're more than what they make. It's not just your widget, it's what you stand for, and we thought there was an opportunity there, and that corporations, all of our lives intersect with corporations, whether it's through their marketing and advertising or their connectivity to, to global leaders in the world. Um, and we were very lucky to partner with the Intel Corporation that had been investing in girls and women for years and had been getting no credit, and who understood that we wanted editorial, complete editorial freedom, and who wanted a way to talk to their constituency about their investments of, in women and girls. Um, and that was an incredible partnership. 
On the NGO side, they were the first people we called. And what we said is, um, your marketing budget is this big. We know that because Charity Navigator, you know, you get disciplined if you spend too much money on marketing. Well, if you're a small business owner and you were told that you could only spend a tiny percentage of, of, of your budget on marketing, you would have very few customers. So we knew as NGOs, they have one arm tied behind their back around telling the story of what they're doing to attract support for what they're doing, right? So we said to them, if you partner with us, we'll, we will create content for you free of charge during the course of the campaign. We will, we will help you message. And we did it. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars creating mini campaigns for our partners along the way, using our skills as storytellers and saying, what are you launching? OK, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Um, and it created a real sense of collaboration. Um, so by the time the film came out, um, there, we, we had three years under our belt with our partners. Um, I'm not going to say it was all smooth sailing, because the other pr challenge that the NGOs have is they have very limited staff. So even though they were so deeply supportive of Girl Rising, sometimes they couldn't do as much as we asked for them towards the end. Um, and sometimes we couldn't do as much as we wanted to do for them. Um, but basically, I think that we've created a new, um, a new way for storytellers and, and, and NGOs to partner. Um, and they understand that the, sometimes the way they've been telling stories is not the most effective. Yes, Molly. You can tell I talk a lot. So I'm sorry for my run-on sentence answers. Thank you again for coming. My name is Molly McGowan, and I'm a Clinton School grad. And I think you have us all hooked, um, those of us who haven't seen it in the audience. It's really fabulous. So thank you for your incredible work. But my question is a pretty simple one. How, I know there have been some local screenings here, but how do we see it if we miss those? I am so excited you asked, because as of last Saturday, you can now download a digital download um, on our website, girlrising.com or Hulu, Netflix, you can buy it on the, in the Apple Store. You, Girl Rising is now commercially available! Yay! Um, that said, for those of you who work within corporations or in organizations, I really recommend watching this film as a group. Um, one of our theories of change is that change happens when you get people together and you discuss an issue. Um, so if you're working on local problems or global problems, I urge you, Girl Rising is just a tool. You can surround it with whatever you want to surround it with in terms of your, we call them packing poppers, you know? Um, so you can watch it as a full film. You can watch it as three chapters. You can watch it as five chapters. But um, watch it with the people you're trying to reach. Have a conversation. Come together to enjoy it, even if it's just as your family, right? Get some neighbors over. Um, it's an emotional, powerful experience, and I believe one um, best consumed in groups. It's also part of our theory of change. Uh, Patrick Hayes uh, used to be the mayor of North Little Rock, but I'm, I'm almost a little embarrassed as I look around, and I don't see too many of my gender uh, that are here. Is, uh, it, and I, I guess I, I'm confused because it sure seems to me that the rising tide lifts all boats. And, is there a gender issue in this country in terms of recognizing the benefits of educating our women? Yes, there is, Patrick. And um, I, <laughs> thanks for asking. You're hired. Um, I think that um, I think that's changing too. As you see more um, uh, studies about um, uh, companies that have uh, mixed gender diversity on their boards perform better. Um, Let's face it, at the end of the day, an economic argument is always going to win the day. Um, and uh, as you see um, more uh, young women getting degrees than young men, um, higher education, et cetera, as you see more households being flipped um, where the women are the, are the um, greater breadwinner. That said, you know, we made a film called Girl Rising. Um, it has an incredibly strong magnetic effect to women and girls. We have to work much harder on our end to bring more men and boys in. Um, as I said to my small group, 
I love men and boys. I'm a big champion of men. Um, I'm not interested in a world that's run by women any more than I'm interested in a world that's run by men. I'm interested in a world where um, equality rules the day, great ideas rule the day, hard work rules the day, um, and equal opportunity. Uh, in this country, we actually have a challenge with our boys, right? Our big vision is that we equalize secondary graduation rates for boys and girls by 2030. And what that means is in, in countries where boys are behind, we got a different thing to look at. Um, so equality rules the day, and if every one of you men today goes out and tells your, tell your men friends about Girl Rising and get them, as I call it, in line at the ice cream store, we're on our way. Because it really takes someone you trust to deliver a message that you trust to start to make global change. Um, I wanted to point out um, the other thing that I like to say, which is an individual has so much power to make change. Your decision on any given day about how you spend your time or your resources or your advice has an enormous power. In that short film, you saw two individuals who changed the trajectory of a life. Bimal Sir, the young tutor who taught Zuma, and Sita Didi, the social worker who went house to house and convinced one by one, it's like, it's like uh, campaigning, right? You have the power to make change. If you told me five years ago that I would be standing next to the Clinton Library, speaking in front of an audience of the next, of our next leaders of this world about this, I would never have believed you. You have the power to fulfill your dreams, make change, and bring others along with you. Let's, uh, let's thank Holly. What a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. And uh, please, please come visit with her uh, before you leave if you have any other questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, guys.